Today, with joy, we welcome to our pulpit our dear friend and this year's baccalaureate speaker, Dr. Walter Earl Fluker, along with his wonderful wife, Dr. Sharon Fluker. We embrace them, we celebrate them. It's a happy, glad-hearted morning. Walter Earl Fluker is a well-known figure in the theory and practice of ethical leadership. Dr. Fluker holds the position of Distinguished Professor of the Howard Thurman Center at Hartford International University for Religion and Peace, and previously served as Dean's Professor of Spirituality, Ethics, and Leadership at Emory University's Candler School of Theology. At Morehouse College, he was the founding director of the Andrew Young Center for Global Leadership and the Coca-Cola Professorship of Leadership Studies. He is a Martin Luther King Jr. Professor Emeritus of Ethical Leadership at Boston University and the editor of the Howard Thurman Papers Project. During his tenure at BU, he developed an acclaimed online course titled Ethical Leadership, Character, Civility, and Community. His organi organization, Walter Earl Fluker and Associates Incorporated, continues to advance this mission. A sought-after consultant speaker and workshop leader, Dr. Fluker has shared his expertise at various institutions and organizations worldwide. Recently, he was honored with the 2023 Roosevelt Institute's Four Freedoms Award of Worship, along with Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi, the late activist Adi Barkan, Congressman Benny Thompson, and former executive director of the American Library Association, Tracy D. Hall. Dr. Fluker is a prolific author with notable works including Ethical Leadership, The Quest for Character, Civility, and Community, and The Ground Has Shifted, The Future of the Black Church in Post-Racial America. He also edited the five-volume documentary edition of the pa papers of Howard Washington Thurman, the four-volume Walking with God, the sermon series of Howard Thurman, and the unfinished search for common ground. He earned a BA in philosophy and biblical studies from Trinity College, an MDiv from Garrett Evangelical Seminary, and a PhD in social ethics from BU. He holds an honorary doctorate, Doctor of Humanities from Lee's McRae College. Let us pause to give a warm Marsh Chapel Boston University welcome to this year's baccalaureate speaker. It's great to be home. Thank you. Dr. Hill, I have a long list of greetings I wanted to make to everyone who is in the room, so I won't call all of your names. Uh, but I'm so glad to be here. And I need to thank uh, Scott Jarrett for that wonderful African-American spiritual. God is a rock. I do want to extend special greetings to, of course, my president, Bob Brown, to President-elect Freeman, who was part of the MOOC on ethical leadership, to Provost Luchin Hamas Fakahani. I know that if I say Mr. Fakahani, I'm referring to your father. So it's the full name our board chair. God bless you, my friend. And to my dean, Dr. Sujin Park, thank you so much for having me, Robert. And I'm going to try my best not to bore you. I know that there is a special place in hell for people who bore one another. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to try to stay within the uh, parameters of 15 minutes. I am Baptist, and I'm going to do my very best. 
I'm hearing something this morning, though, that goes like this. There's hope for this world. There's hope for this world. It's all going to be all right. There's hope for this world. I didn't get my PhD in singing, but I want you to get this with me. See if you can just look at your neighbor and sing this with me. There's hope for this world. There's hope for this world. It's all going to be all right. There's hope for this world. One more time. Hope for this world. Hope for this world. It's all going to be all right. I'm indebted, humbled, honored to serve as the baccalaureate speaker on this 151st commencement at Boston University. David, I'm so honored to be listed with you. I'm still reveling over your work, your presence, and what your testimony and story means for this nation at this time. I say that full of a heart of love. I'd like to just simply say to the graduates, you've endured hardships beyond what most of us can comprehend. You've endured pandemics, the stress of major social and political movements, and the imminent challenges that threaten the very fabric of what once was assumed common values and norms of a democratic society. My friends, you are superheroes, and we salute you. I also want to say that you will need all your superpowers going forward because we're at the crossings of madness and hope. The title of my address is taken from the simple yet profound scripture found in the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 9 commonly known as the seventh beatitude. Many of us know it by heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. And for your contemplation, I would like to read two versions of the tale of the tainted grain told by Rebbe Nachman of Breslov, an 18th, 19th century Hasidic reformer. I should add my special thanks to Ariel Berger for sharing this marvelously relevant story with me and to his teacher of blessed memory, our very own Elie Wiesel, from whom he first heard it. Version one goes like this. Are you listening? Once an astrologer, king, saw in the stars that anyone who would eat of the coming year's harvest, Ken would go mad. He called in his viceroy, provost, and friend to ask for his advice. Sar replied to counselor, you and I shall eat only last year's harvest, which is untainted, and so we shall remain sane. But the king replied, I do not accept your proposal. How can we separate ourselves from our people? To remain the only sane people among a nation of madmen, they will think we are the ones who are mad. Instead, you and I shall eat of the tainted grain and shall enter into madness with our people. The king thought for a moment, then said, 
We must, however, at least recognize our malady. Therefore, you and I shall mark each other's foreheads with a sign. And every time we look at one another, we shall remember that we are mad. Second version. Once an astrologer king saw in the stars that anyone who would eat of the coming year's harvest would go mad. He called in his viceroy and friend to ask for his advice. Sar replied to counselor, you and I shall eat only last year's harvest, which is untainted. And so we shall remain sane. But the king replied, I have another solution. I shall eat the tainted grain, and I shall join our people in their madness. You shall not. You will remain the only sane person in all the land. But there is one condition. You must leave the palace. You must wander as a beggar, and you must travel from town to town, from village to village. Everywhere you go, you must shout it in all the marketplaces and from all the rooftops. Remember, my people, that you are mad. However you choose to interpret these two versions, and there are other versions, kind of like the Bible, of the tale of the tainted grain. One lesson is clear. In times of collective madness and chaos, we're, we are called to remember and to act. This is precisely what I want you to take away from this message. If you don't get anything else, we are called, my friends, to be peacemakers. We must remember, retell, and relive our stories because our personal, social, and historical narratives provide us with signs and symbols that have the power to direct our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors for good, if only we dare to remember and act. Rabbi Nachman's story helps us to better understand what is at stake at this very precarious moment in this nation and around the world. The subject of madness has been discussed in a variety of ways as part of the evolution of our history in the Western world. Much of the contemporary literature addresses the ways in which social structures and institutions conspire to perpetuate the problem of the Enlightenment's cleavage between reason and unreason. I have rationality, you don't, Bob. Therefore, you're mad especially in the treatment of mental illness. But I'm careful here, friends, to not equate mental illness, I want to be clear, with madness. Rather, I'm most concerned with the potential for madness. Moral, spiritual, psychological, collective chaos. I'm referring to something deeper, scarier, more like what Emil Durkheim called anomie, or loss of world. And perhaps even more menacing, what our newly appointed Martin Luther King Jr. Professor Emily Towns calls the cultural production of evil, especially in societies like our own, that are plummeting into the madness of hell. We are all aware of the swarming social 
geopolitical, predacious processes that are circling around the globe. Something is happening in our world that keeps us on edge. If you don't feel that, then you are mad. <laughs> Whether it is in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, that doesn't get in the news, Asia, Latin America, or the United States of America. We know that there's something on the horizon that is larger than our own histories and memories. And like a faded hamlet, we know that something is not right, but we're not quite sure how to fix it. <laughs> the time is out of joint, oh, cursed spite, he declares, that ever I was born to set it right. My fellow and soon-to-be alums, I'm running out of time, you should know, I'm always counting time. The time is out of joint. The ground has shifted. Things have changed. In addition to what you have learned here, you will need to gather even more critical tools and critical resources to address the serious ethical contest embedded in these changes. We will need to find different and imaginative ways to address questions of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from poverty, and freedom from fear that President Delano Roosevelt raised on January the 6th, 1941 as he saw the rise of an ugly and diabolical movement on the rise that would change the course of human history. The long litany of ills that plague our nation and the world are only symptomatic, I suggest, of a deeper, more fundamental fracture in our very human, spiritual, and moral foundations. The origins of these problems, you know well, are immensely complex but in some ways they're not so new. So much depends on our human capacity to remember, think, feel, adapt, and act in ways that promote peace, justice, and a sense of community. Like it or not, we're all caught in the web of the spider. No one gets out of this tangled web alone. To mix metaphors, we must be aware of the tainted wheat and the contagion of madness. As our blessed Howard Thurman so eloquently stated, that madness, this fascist masquerade, he called it, is the product of fear, deception, and hatred. And after it is fully manifest, it becomes hell walking on earth. People and societies encounter madness when systems lose their equilibrium and chaos ensues. Chaos theorists remind us, however, that not only is chaos necessary, it can also have its own restorative benefits. We're in an era of encroaching madness. I use it over and over again I don't know if I am the one sent to tell you, or you're the one, or you're the one, or you're the one, but somebody needs to remind us it's encroaching. How shall we remember that we are becoming mad? We must find the courage to warn our fellows and to speak to them about the other side of madness, which is peace. But how shall we? Are there signs that others have left for us? Ari Berger, also a BU alum, he writes this. Elie Wiesel taught us that sanity is not the best way to fight moral madness that overtakes societies. Instead, we must fight moral madness with a better madness, a holy madness. I turn and I'm almost done, you good? <laughs> Breathe. Outside of this chapel, in Marsh 
Plaza. There's the abstract sculpture dedicated to our most distinguished alumnus, Martin Luther King, Jr. Chilean sculptor Sergio Castillo called it free at last, echoing the famous crescendo from Martin Luther King, Jr.'s 1963 speech at the Lincoln Memorial. I, as many of you, have stood before this monument, sometimes alone in contemplation and at various moments when the community comes together to pause, reflect, advocate, and remember ourselves. That is who we are and who we are called to be. The sculpture is made of rust-covered sheets of hammered Horton steel, welded together from a flock of 50 doves in flight. Each dove represents one of the 50 states of our union. From afar, the flock merges to form the outline of a single dove arching toward the sky, calling us to the work of peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Martin King was a peacemaker, my friends. He was a drum major for peace, but towards the end of his life, he was not happy. Rather, he was struck by holy madness. He was not satisfied, and nor should we be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an overflowing stream. Peacemaking is difficult work. It is not for spectators. We remember best King's impassioned, I have a dream speech. But there are so many other speeches he made, especially towards the end of his life, when even he struggled with clinical depression. Remember that speech. We have some difficult days ahead. Then he said, but it doesn't matter now, because I've been to the promontory, and I've overlooked the unrealized future, and I still see the possibility of hope. Forgive me for preaching in Marsh Chapel. <laughs> King struck a chord that evening. He was the activist, the prophet, who reminds us that, yes, we are tip-tilting towards madness. But we must also have the courage to hope. He paid dearly at the crossings of madness and hope. But he has left us a sign. May I borrow two minutes? We are called to be signs of peace in a world that is on the brink of chaos. Brothers in the hood say, if I'm lying, I'm flying. As King wrote, we are confronted with the urgency of now. This may be humankind's last chance to choose between chaos or community. My dear graduates, soon to be alums, and alums who are present here and in digital space, we are the heirs of the vision of Dr. King. It is a dream of peace that continues, and no one can claim it as their own until they are willing to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before their God. Martin King's vision of a peaceful world house is not a dream for cravens and cowards who hide behind false justifications for non-action. 
It is not for spectators who stand on the sidelines and watch injustice and exploitation from a distance. It is not for those vain religious practitioners who bury their heads in the sand like the proverbial ostrich and pretend that everything will be all right anyway. For when we bury our heads in the sands, my friends, we always leave more exposed than is hidden. This is not a dream for the greedy and insane puppeteers who hide behind the curtains of social fiction and manipulate the mindscape. It is not for sentimentalists and vain practitioners of a dysfunctional American civil religion where we wave the, the flag higher than we wave the cross. No, friends. It is a dream for those who are willing to join the ranks of men and women everywhere who are so inspired by the moral order of the universe and the sacredness of human personality that they are willing to make a track to the water's edge and to lay their bodies down as a bridge for future generations to travel over into the land of freedom. It is a dream for women and men who are willing to stand alone when the crowds disperse, who will keep on moving against the odds, who refuse to cling to falsehoods and lies that contradict reality, who believe that truth has the final word in this universe and that justice and love will endure forever. This is the dream of the peacemaker. This is the dream of Dr. King a dream born out of a zeal for peace and justice, nurtured in the praxis of struggle, refined in the fires of persecution, strengthened by the arms of faith, propelled by the vision of hope, enriched by the power of love, and set free by the truth that no lie can endure forever. We are his heirs. We are the ones to whom he has passed the torch. We are the dreamers who must make this world a better place. We are the ones who must continue his dream of peace and justice for the peoples of the earth. Dream on, dreamers. Dream in season and out of season. Dream in the valley and climb to the mountain and see the land of freedom and justice and peace. See what the prophets saw. See what the king saw. If your vision is rooted in justice and truth, there is no power on earth that can nullify its mandate. Politics can't legislate it. Poverty can't define it. Racism can't destroy it. Religious bigotry can't condemn it. Sexism can't vanquish it. Water can't drown it. Fire can't consume it. Death can't kill it. Hell can't hold it. Greedy and insane men can't prevent it. For it lives in the mind of the one who has said yes. Yes. And no other power in the universe can say no to that yes. Begin again. <laughs> Hope again. Walk together, children. Don't you get weary. Great camp meeting in the promised land.